All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, the West Watch. This is Dan McAvoy from the Western Regional Climate Center. Um, I'm gonna give it another minute or so and, and let a few others join, and then we'll get started. All right, well, I've got 201 and change, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, um, thanks for joining the West Watch today. This is uh, Dan McAvoy at the Western Regional Climate Center. Um, and today's uh, West Watch will be slightly different from last month's. So this will be the, uh, the old school format where we have the climate update from myself and then the coastal updates from our IUS partners. Um, but first, um, in case, those ha uh, people haven't been on before, or just to refresh everyone, what exactly is the West Watch? This is now a monthly webinar series, um, and it's meant to bring together NOAA staff and partners from across the region to share information about climate observations and also the impacts uh, all across the West and the coastal areas. Um, and so there are now two formats. This occurs um, uh, monthly, so we're going on a rotating a basis here last night uh, last month um, Joe Casola was leading this and a big thanks to Joe um, he's the regional climate services director for the West for um, reorganizing this and working in these two different formats um, so now when when Joe's leading it's gonna they're gonna be on uh, specific topics last month we had the McKinney fire and associated impacts um, and then every other month we'll come come in back into this format where we have the general uh, climate notion uh, overviews. And so a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, so we're going to um, have one quick poll question here for, for the audience um, in just a moment that Joe just put up, put up on the screen there. So we'll wait a few seconds for people to answer that. All right, well, thank you all um, for answering that. We do have uh, some new attendees today, so thanks for joining and thanks for those who uh, are coming back and attending again. Um, we can move through the housekeeping now. So we're gonna have uh, four presenters today, including myself, and I'll um, list those off here in just a minute. Um, if you do have questions for the presenters, um, please uh, enter them into the questions box on your uh, toolbar on the right. There should be a questions box and a chat box. It, it should work a little more smoothly if we enter everything into that questions box. And then uh, Joe will help field those questions. Um, if we have time, hopefully we can have a brief Q&A after each speaker. Um, and then again, at the very end for additional questions. And um, these will be recorded now, which is uh, another great addition um, that Joe has added. So people will be able to view these recordings and then we'll have a, a survey um, that will be sent around to everyone. Um, so today's speaker, uh, this is the, the lineup we've had in the past. I'll be giving the, um, the overview of the climate conditions and, and, and so update and outlook. Uh, then we'll have uh, Jan Newton from uh, NANUS um, giving the Pacific uh, Northwest Coast Update and Henry Roll from the Central Region and Clarissa Anderson from the Southern Region giving those updates for us. And so I'm going to jump right in here with the uh, the climate update and outlook. Um, and again, I'm in Reno, Nevada at the uh, Western Regional Climate Center, uh, which is housed at the Desert Research Institute. Um, so let's get right into what's been going on so far this water year. Um, our water year uh, begins on October 1st and runs through uh, September 30th. 
And so these are showing on the left the uh, total precipitation anomalies since uh, October 1st um, as a percentage of average. And then on the right, the, uh, the temperature anomalies also since October 1st. And so we do have on the left, focus on the precipitation, some areas um, that have well above average precipitation. There's um, areas in, in California and Nevada into the Colorado River Basin and, and um, large portions of the West that are well over 100% of average or even 150% of average, a little bit drier um, across the Pacific Northwest, but nothing um, too extreme in terms of dry anomalies at this point. But I think what uh, stands out even more um, so uh, than the precipitation anomalies are the temperature anomalies and the fact that um, almost that entire map on the right is blue, indicating below average temperatures um, for that whole period since the beginning of the water year. Um, and we just haven't had a lot of um, cold or below average uh, relative to where you're at um, seasons um, in a long time, and especially during uh, the winter months, um, which uh, has persisted for a long time now. Um, and this is one trace of um, temperature over time uh, from Tahoe City, um, right on Lake Tahoe there in the uh, central northern Sierra Nevada. And this is the uh, the temperatures, the, the November 1st through February 20th temperatures at Tau City going all the way back to the early 1900s when the records began there. And this season so far has been the coldest since 1952. And so, you know, it doesn't just uh, feel cold. It actually has been one of the colder years on record in, in parts of the West, seventh coldest for this particular location and much, much colder than the past few years, which is probably why it feels uh, so cold across the region. And um, so the precipitation for some areas obviously drives the snowpack, but the temperatures have also played a role in maintaining that snowpack. Um, this uh, current map is showing the, um, the NRCS uh, snow tail sites, the dots there, and then the basins, um, the river basins there, the snow water equivalent a percent of median from February 19th. Um, and so on this map, uh, the blues and greens are above normal snowpack and the yellows and oranges and browns are below normal. And it's nice to see that um, at the basin scale, it's almost all green and blue. And um, those same areas where you saw the really high percent of average precipitations are have really, uh, really high snowpack, some over 200 percent of normal um, for the time. And I think another point to make here is that a lot of these places are not just above normal for the time of year. They've also exceeded uh, the median peak snow water equivalent, which typically occurs um, around April 1st. And so this happened really early for a lot of places um, in uh, late January. And we'll, we'll discuss um, how that unfolded and why that happened so quickly. And a lot of it had to do with this barrage of, of atmospheric rivers that has been impacting the West Coast. Um, this is a graphic put together um, at Scripps uh, where they summarize where these atmospheric rivers make landfall. I think many on the call know what an atmospheric river is, but for those who might not, um, it is uh, the name for a storm system that carries a substantial amount of water, uh, water vapor through the atmosphere in sort of narrow, um, bands that can extend from the subtropics and tropical regions in the Pacific um, and again carrying lots of moisture that unloads once it hits uh, reaches the land and um, dumps out as uh, precipitation and rain and snow and these are critical uh, for the west coast especially California and the southwest and bringing big chunks of the total uh, water year precipitation and so um, you can see there's been a total of 24. Uh, this was updated as of January 17th. Um, the atmospheric river activity has quieted down a lot since then. Um, but what I want to really point out are the, the storms that it really made landfall on the California coast, um, basically from late December through mid-January. There were a whole bunch of them. Several of them were strong. A bunch of them were moderate. Um, and there was one exceptional uh, AR that occurred on December 27th. Um, and there are a few pointed down towards the southwest there, Southern California coast, that really also helped bring water to um, parts of the southwest. Um, and so these storms have really been responsible for the really big um, rain and snow totals. And this is a graph, these are graphics from the Weather Prediction Center. 
um, showing uh, the rain and snowfall from December 26th through January 17th, the top left is total precipitation. Um, and those areas that are shaded in that bright pink color in the Sierra Nevada and the coastal uh, mountain ranges uh, received over 30 inches of precipitation uh, from those storms. Um, and some places had record-breaking 23-day rainfall totals, including Oakland, San Francisco, um, and Stockton, California. And then on the bottom right is the, the, the uh, total snowfall from that same period. And the magenta in the mountains there in the Sierra is over 180 inches of snow for that period. So really big snowfall over a relatively short period of time. Mammoth Mountain uh, reported 240 inches of snow during that time period. Just a huge amount of snowfall in, in a short period of time. Um, but really got the season off to a good start. And I also want to emphasize that this is this wasn't just impacting uh, California. As you go inland, Great Basin, um, and into the southwest, Arizona, and the Colorado River Basin, they all benefited um, from these atmospheric river storms. Um, so if we look kind of more currently, this is a map from the, the snowtail sites in the mountains now, um, showing the precipitation percent of average from the past 30 days. As I mentioned, the atmospheric rivers really have quieted down quite a bit, and you see a lot of red dots here for the past 30 days, indicating less than 50% of average precipitation for that time period. Um, there are a few regions, um, Montana and parts of Wyoming, um, that have had uh, a wetter period during that time. But generally, the West had, has quieted down um, since then, uh, but that is not really all that concerning given what i just showed you on how much rain and snow came over that um you know three to four week period and that it's stay, been staying cold to help preserve uh the snowpack and just to show you what some of these traces of the snowpack look like um to show you how much came at once and what's happened since then um, so these are traces of snow water equivalent at a couple of different river basins with a number of snow tail stations averaged together um, on the upper left is the Carson River Basin in the eastern Sierra Nevada, um, right near Lake Tahoe. Um, and so we see the, the black trace is the 2023 value. I also highlighted the red trace, which was last year. And then the green is the seasonal median. And that star is the, the median peak. And so you see what these storms did. Um, these atmospheric rivers just really skyrocketed the snowpack there this year to above um, record levels in, in the snowtail record. Um, and really it was that record snowpack up until just a few days ago. Um, and it, it never completely shut off. There's been small storms since then, but much less than what we saw um, over that three week period. Um, and well, almost double the season seasonal median peak, which is huge from a water resources standpoint. Um, and nothing like what we saw last year where we had a good start and then things just shut off. And then on the bottom right to show you um, a similar pattern in the upper Colorado Dolores Basin. Um, again, they got a really big boost from those storms as well in late December and, and early to mid January, and it's quieted down a bit, but that basin is also above the seasonal median peak again, which is just really great news for the upper Colorado from a water resources standpoint. Um, again, to emphasize, you know, how much snow really fell in uh, the Sierra Nevada. Um, so uh, monthly there are manual snow survey sur surveys that get done and these have been taking place for over a hundred years in some parts of the west and in, in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so on the left there is a trace um, of the February 1st snow survey from Mammoth Pass down near Mammoth Mountain at about uh, 9,300 feet. And this year had this, the highest February 1 uh, SWE value uh, since the records began um, uh, right around 1930, they had over 60 or, or right around 60 inches of snow water equivalent, um, which is huge. And then on the right is the map uh, showing all those highlighted in dark blue uh, were the highest SWE on record for that February 1st uh, date. So again, um, just a huge amount of snow during that short time period. So uh, Really, this what all this has done is is really make some substantial improvements to the drought conditions across uh, huge portions of the West. Uh, many have been um, in drought for going on you know three to four years, and so um, these these storm systems have really benefited their areas with um, no drought at all, and some are just in that 
um, area of abnormally dry, which is the yellow. So the one on the left is from the beginning of the water year on October 4th. And then the snapshot on the right is on uh, from this most recent one from February 14th. So some drought does remain because again, these were deficits that have accumulated over several years. Um, and it's gonna take time to replenish um, things like reservoirs, and groundwater systems um, to really totally eliminate this drought. Um, I did wanna share one graphic um, that Mike Dettinger pr provided. Um, Mike is uh, from Scripps and the USGS. And um, what these basically show is that uh, there were, again, really big precipitation deficits that accumulated over a three-year period since 2019. Some parts of the region, California and Nevada, were you know, uh, one and a half to two years missing precipitation due to all the dryness over those three drought years in a row. Um, and it was looking good um, as of January run. We already had some storms that had benefited but the January storms alone completely eliminated some of those three-year uh, deficits. So again, can't emphasize enough how impactful and um, how much those uh, moisture-laden atmospheric rivers are needed to help um, erase drought. Um, so I mentioned the reservoirs. Um, how are they looking across the West? Um, so this is a snapshot of the major reservoirs across the Western US from February 20th. Um, and these are teacup, teacup diagrams, and what they're showing is the um, the size of the cup is relative to the full capacity of the reservoir, um, and then the red line, dotted line across the cup is the average for the date, and then the blue is the amount of water in the reservoir um, as of the date. And so we see that a lot of the reservoirs across the West have um, started to gain a lot of water and getting closer to that average for this, this time of year, particularly in California and, and parts of the uh, upper Colorado have gained a lot of uh, water into the reservoirs. Where we haven't seen big uh, changes are in Lake Mead and Lake Powell and also Elvin Butte, which are also at critically low levels um, from now, you know, decades um, of drought um, that really can't be erased by one single year. Um, and just some numbers from Lake Mead and Lake Powell to sort of reemphasize that all this rain and snow is helpful, but it's not going to eliminate what's the situation there um, in these these huge reservoirs. Powell's currently at 23% full, Lake Mead 29%, and the system um, is is a bit a little bit less full than it was at this time last year. The better news is on the bottom, which is showing the the forecasted water year inflows. Um, which they have, this is into Lake Powell at 109%. Uh, we'll see how that evolves as we go into spring. That will certainly change one way or the other. But the water year to date precipitation and snowpack, again, for the upper Colorado and Salt Verde basins are both well above normal. So that um, is very encouraging. So, um, and again, there's going to be a lot more water actually coming into the system over the next seven days across a big part of the West. Map on the left is all the watches and warnings from the National Weather Service as of this morning. A lot of those are winter storm watches and warnings, uh, blizzard watches and warnings, and, and wind advisories. And then on the right is the total uh, precipitation forecast for the next seven days. Again, most of the West getting a good uh, shot of, of rain and snow coming if it hasn't already started for you uh, today. Um, so I wanted to quickly run through the ENSO update. Um, this is all from on this slide from the Climate Prediction Center. Um, we are still in a La Nina advisory, but it is fading pretty quickly. We can see on the map on the right um, that the Eastern Pacific uh, near the coast of South America is already starting to warm above average. Um, but across the whole basin, it is below average. Um, and uh, and so neutral conditions are expected to begin uh, within the next couple of months and then persist into the spring and summer. And you can see that in these forecasts from IRI and the Climate Prediction Center on the left showing the probabilities of La Nina neutral or El Nino. And again, we see after the January, February, March season on the left that that quickly transitions to above 80% chance of going into uh, ENSO neutral conditions. Um, there is a possible return to the El Nino conditions by mm -hmm. the summer and into next fall. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that right now, and it, it, there's really not a whole lot of confidence at this point in the year 
we need to give that some more time to evolve. Um, and so in terms of the outlooks moving forward, these, this is the 8 to 14 day outlook. And we've seen a lot of this in the West this year on the left, showing these much higher probabilities of below normal temperatures. Again, so continuing that trend of the cold winter across the West and above normal precipitation, the bullseye really centered um, over California and the Great Basin um, and uh, parts of Arizona. Um, and finally, the seasonal outlook that goes um, from March through May that was released earlier uh, this month um, on the left showing the temperature outlook. Um, not an incredibly strong signal anywhere. Um, as you go further into the southwest, um, the odds of above normal uh, temperatures are a bit stronger and below normal temperatures across the Pacific Northwest and, and Montana. Uh, not much signal at all across the central parts of the West could go either way. And uh, the only real signal for precipitation is that the odds are showing um, below normal uh, uh, chances of precipitation across the, the Four Corners area with no strong signal either way um, across the rest of the West. I think with that, I will finish um, and I think I'll pass it over to Jan, unless we're going to do questions right now. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Joe, how do you want to do this? Looks like he's passing it okay. for me. To you. Yeah, so I, I just passed it over to you, Jan, and, and we didn't get any questions in, in the questions box, but if you do have questions for Dan, feel free to uh, to add those in and we can, can swing back and tackle those in a little bit. Thanks, Joe. Great. Well, thank you, Dan, so much, and thank you, Joe, for organizing these. Um, um, I always learn so much from your talks, Dan, and um, I'm now starting a series of three talks from the uh, regional associations, focusing more on the uh, marine conditions. So I'm representing the Pacific Northwest on behalf of NANUS. <clears throat> okay. All right, so starting where Joe left, or excuse me, where Dan left off, the uh, La Nina signal that you see here in this false color image of the sea surface temperature anomaly. So warm um, being the red and bluer than average being the um, blue. This was the monthly average for November and then December and then January. So you can really see that La Nina um, signal fading. And so um, that's very consistent with the forecast that, uh, that Dan presented. This is another app that tells you about um, marine heat waves as defined, but to certain metrics of duration and intensity. And so the, the orange and the browns are showing you where marine heat waves that meet those criteria exist. And you see definitely um, not any really in our region close to the coast anymore, unlike how things had been um, earlier. Uh, here's a snapshot from the um, Oregon State University MODIS saddle, um, rendition of satellite data and uh, showing a, an expanded view up near the coast and you do see some variability but if you look at the color saturation there you're, you're seeing anomalies of around one degree or so um, one degree celsius <clears throat> so let's look at the buoys um, these data come from um, a buoy that's about 200 miles off the coast um, national data buoy from NOAA, and so there is the annual pattern for 2022. And then what we've done is splice on the beginning of this year, 2023. Um, and you can see that the black line is the seasonal cycle based on 45 years worth of data. The um, dark blue line is where we are now in terms of the data. And you can see we're smack on normal, um, the seasonal cycle though earlier in the um, 2022. Uh, around September, we definitely had a, a strong, uh, warm, warmer than average waters. Okay, so pretty normal for now. Uh, here now are several coastal buoys up and down the coast, Cape Elizabeth, the Columbia River Bar, uh, Stonewall Bank, and Eel River, so Washington, Oregon, and even down into Northern California. Um, you see the 
uh, blue line now is a lot more squiggly than you saw in the previous graphic. Coastal dynamics entering in there, but even though you, you see a little bit on, on either side of the line, it's pretty much dancing around within one standard deviation or pretty, pretty normal. Um, okay, uh, moving inland now into Puget Sound, we have profiling buoys um, around the sound. Two of them, the ones on the left, are in a sub-basin called Hood Canal, which is a deep fjord-like body of water. And two of them are um, over in the main basin and southern sound of Puget Sound and have very different physical attributes. And you can really see that playing out in these um, water temperature anomalies. So same color coding with warmer than average red, cooler than average blue, but now you're seeing the full depth prop profile. So this has a CTD that profiles up and down. And so you're seeing the time series of that. And what's really striking is that for last year, you saw very different patterns in the, um, in the heat anomalies. Um, and so what's up with that? So um, Hood Canal being predominantly red, but if you look up at the surface, you see some strong um, dark blue uh, anomalies. And uh, we did have strong weather forcing and we did feel effects from the La Nina, but um, the difference is these basins, the physical oceanography, if I show you just one profile, the ones in Hood Canal are really stratified. So the atmospheric signal doesn't penetrate. And what we had is the leftover warmer than average waters um, from previous that were still there and, and hadn't flushed out yet. Whereas in um, South Sound and also for the main basin, you have extremely well mixed waters, um, which are well flushed. So the basins are reacting very differently due to the, the variation in the climate. And, and we know that climate is going to impact our waters in different ways, but it really have to take into consideration the depth extent of that and, and then think about how biology might interact with that. So a fish that has a temperature threshold for its spawning or, or so. Okay, so um, that is something that we saw. Now, going back out to the coast, um, I want to share with you some data also from 2022. I guess I'm going to say that because the, the conditions that we're seeing right now are pretty average and normal, there's not much to report about the current data. So um, the last uh, story and this one, I'm focusing on some of the 2022 data. And this is another profiling buoy that we have off of La Push, Washington. John Mickett, um, Dana Manalang from the University of Washington are the lead PIs for this. And this is just an incredible data set. And what you see, temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen, these are not anomalies. These are the actual values. And then you see some um, measurements of velocity, either a long shelf or cross shelf in the, in the bottom two panels. And so um, <laughs> this is rich and you could, John Mickett could give a lecture on these data, you know, that would last 30, 50 minutes. Um, I'm not going to, um, but to pull out some of the highlights, if you um, start with salinity during this period, John tells me that it was um, consistent upwelling characteristics, upwelling was sustained. And you see this salinity signal um, filling with, with more and more um, of the higher salinity waters. So that's more of the deep, high salinity waters getting pushed onto the shelf. So tend to see an oxygen signal that um, more of the hypoxia, the low oxygen, is in the second part of the year. And, uh, um, or the, the data record, not necessarily the year. And you see it's very pulsing, um, these, and, and you can see that also in the salinity to some extent as well. And then if you look at the uh, along shelf velocities, so the um, hot, oops, sorry, the hot colors are um, the northward uh, transport uh, along the counter to the California current. And so these are pulses of water, um, coastally trapped internal waves that are pushing um, 
from the south to the north, and they tend to be associated also with the lower oxygen, higher salinity water. And so, um, as I said, this is really a rich um, data set, but it's allowing us to understand more about the dynamics of hypoxia. And I want to also mention um, some slides that, that we presented briefly last time, and I want to expand a little bit. This is work with the Quinault Indian Nation, um, excuse me, Quileute, oh, so sorry, Quileute Indian tribe. Um, Jennifer Hagen is the lead for this, this work, um, and she worked also with John Mickett of the University of Washington to design these landers that sit on the bottom and measure deep water oxygen. And so this is you know, kind of when you see <laughs> the government and partnerships actually working out well. There was a bad um, um, disaster with the, with the crab um, um, disaster relief program for when we had the, the large crab fishery disaster in 2015. Um, the BIA allowed some um, funds, the Bipartisan Budget Act allowed some funds and so this is what the Kuliut tribe elected to do, is let's get some sensors out that can give us warning about the hypoxia and what we're going to see. So here are now just temperature and salinity, and you can clearly see um, that when we have cold and salty, that's during the upwelling, and when we um, those reverse, oh, things get warmer and less salty, that's downwelling, and then upwelling returning. Here's the oxygen record. Um, upwelling, low oxygen, I put in the line for hypoxia. But what I just want to um, illustrate really briefly is look at the difference between those two July, August periods. And, you know, whether you're in conditions that look like this or conditions that look like that, that means a lot to being able to catch live Dungeness crab. Um, and then the interesting how September, October looked relatively similar in, in these two years. Um, but, and if you look at the duration of hypoxia, you see sometimes it's intermittent and sometimes it's sustained. So all that to say, I think we're learning a lot from this time series about the ability to predict these, these deleterious events. Um, I'm out of time. I'll say that the um, ocean color also didn't show much of a signal a um, little bit lower um, than average chlorophyll anomalies. And that's my summary. And so I will, one last thing really quickly to say that we are so proud that we now have a new HFR in our fleet off of the Washington coast and new website. So with that, I will end and thank you. Any questions? Am I just not hearing? No, still no questions. A very quiet group today, a little, a little <laughs> reserved. But I encourage folks to put some questions in for uh, for Dan or uh, Jan, and uh, we'll turn things over to Henry. Hello. So yeah, we're coming on to the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System Westwatch update, um, and so I think everybody on the line will. Appreciate that. Yeah, this uh, this winter has seen some um, historic storms for our region, uh, and so that on the left you'll see an image from a restaurant um, uh, nearby where we where our office is. Um, and so there was a whole uh, a sort of um, seafront area that had sustained uh, substantial damage, and several other locations around Santa Cruz uh, were among the most notable things that happened. But there was da damage up and down the the west coast and various levels from these atmospheric rivers and such things. And so um, you can see some uh, damages to piers there, the, the water coming up over top of the pier. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not out of use, obviously, for, for quite a while that there is a effort to restore that pier. And um, we were fortunate to have a visit of the president and uh, some other congressional and state uh, represent, representatives. And so that was uh, nice to see that support. Here's another image from Seacliff State Beach uh, in, in the Santa Cruz area. And you can see this, this is an RV um, parking facility for, for, for beach camping and so on. And it is um, had you know cement and everything uh, and asphalt uh, ripped away in several 
about two meters of, of sand removed and, and such things. And so there's um, an, also another pier in this area that extended out to the the old abandoned Palo Alto shipwreck. Um, and so that pier has been demolished just in the last day or so, uh, unfortunately. Not sure that there's any plan to, to rebuild that one. But just some visualizations of things that have been happening. Um, and so here we have on the left side uh, some wave tracker uh, visualization. And there's two periods displayed there, one um, from uh, Christmas Eve through uh, to just after New Year. And as we go down those various lines, starting from Humboldt Bay down to Diablo Canyon, it just runs from north to south. Monterey Bay is just about in the middle there. And we can see some, some large swells, particularly um, uh, around New Year. And then the period, the next one over to the to the right in the center of the screen there is um, from just after New Year through uh, about the 12th of January. You can see also there's a very large storm that comes through around the, the 6th, 5th and 6th to 7th, and, and that's where we see, we see that um, damage happening. And on the bottom side of those panels, uh, uh, you can um, see these wave spectra, and you can see, particularly in the early January uh, segment, some large swells uh, happening up and down the coast uh, in a way that we weren't seeing even in December. And I just wanted to also point out that this data comes from the, the California, rather the, sorry, the Coastal uh, Data Information Program, CDIP, which is run out of Scripps Oceanography. Um, and so these that's where these uh, data from these buoys comes from. And on the right side, you can see they have a wave uh, uh, prediction model that is um, experimental, but it can be really useful for having another source of wave information for the area. Uh, and thinking about, you know, where are we in terms of our climate uh, condition? It's, I think it's resonating uh, with what we've heard so far. So the multi oh, Henry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're only getting a, a portion of your slide. Um, only, only kind of hmm. about maybe two thirds of it is showing. That's uh, interesting. It's in full screen mode for me. Um, yeah, I haven't been able to see more than just a bit of the slides. Maybe, yeah, if you restart, maybe the resolution just got all whack. No, it's not the same thing. Maybe just go from um, that view. Yeah, because otherwise we can only see a very tiny amount. Right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm not able to see what, what you see, unfortunately. Uh, let's see here when I'm in full screen mode. Um, but I think, we, yeah, this is okay for carrying on, I think. Um, and so, so we've got this multivariate ocean climate index that we uh, have uh, for California, and it's comprised of some, you know, what are really global pattern indicators uh, down to regional, and then uh, within three regions of California. Um, and the, the pattern here, let's see here. Uh, yeah, the pattern here is um, similar to what we've heard earlier, that it's kind of in a transition or intermediate stage between what we might think of normally as happening during La Nina versus El Nino. And the most uh, recent condition there is just in that sort of right, right near zero. For Northern California, we also have a, uh, this index runs in Northern, Central, and Southern California. And again, it's um, pretty close to zero nominal conditions for this ocean index indicator. Looking at shore stations uh, along the coast. So this is something we, we frequently look at um, in our updates here. So the there's three stations reporting there uh, up and down the coast. And the green that you see there is a condition, uh, rather an indicator of the uh, score, the, the real-time quality assurance quality control score that we get with this data. And as you look, this is the past 180 days so that um, you can see there on the, towards the end of the, the series there in all three panels, you can see some warming, warm, warmer than average conditions, and then returning to cooler than average conditions. And that sort of several weeks of warmer conditions was in relation to those atmospheric rivers. And here we have the NDBC buoys, three of them from our region, similar to what Jan was showing. Uh, so these are daily anomalies of sea surface temperature. Um, 
and some, you see some of that um, warming associated with the storms in the northern, a little bit in the central, but really nominal um, throughout, it's fair to say, at least in the last um, 100 days or so. And so this is another one that we frequently uh, show. And so this is data from uh, ocean gliders. So these are buoyancy-driven gliders that run a transect from, in this case, from Monterey out to out to sea, about 400 kilometers offshore. And so um, on the y-axis with axis with these graphs, you have depth, and on the bottom uh, x-axis, you have distance from shore, where the shore is oriented to the right side of each panel. Uh, and so this can give us an idea about, um, you know, the, the layering of the uh, temperatures in the ocean, which can ha have things to do with mixing, particularly along the coast where we get uh, upwelling. So I think as most folks um, on the line appreciate, upwelling is a sort of core ecosystem structuring feature um, for California. And so we've been looking at how to visualize this, um, these uh, indices that uh, Mike Jaycox has been, and, and colleagues have, have been developing for a while. Uh, and updating. Uh, and so there's the coastal upwelling transport index and then the uh, biologically effect effective upwelling transport index. And so we've got, um, it's composed of one degree bins along the coast and then on the x-axis for each of these is the, the, the uh, latitude and then along the y-axis is time and then the intensity shown uh, there by the colors. And so there's two scales so that the top row is uh, the last um, two and a half months or so leading up until about New Year's and the bottom uh, row is a longer period going out, out to starting in 2020. So the last three years really of, of uh, data and you can see the seasonal patterns in those longer uh, records as well. And you can also see from this anomaly and, um, and, the, and the values that are shown that it's kind of nominal right now as well, uh, something we appreciated, but you can see um, that you know, occasionally in the past it's been pretty intense, and so we can use use this as an indicator going forward to uh, help visualize this important feature. And with that, I will pass it back unless there's questions. Yes, we got a question. Um, how do you interpret the MOCI MOCI when describing to a lay audience? That's a, a great question. <laughs> so that's, um, I think uh, one thing that would be valuable for us to do is to sort of decompose it a bit. Uh, and so I've talked with the um, the lead investigator for that, who's part of our, our Senkus um, PI network, uh, and as to how to to do that in a way that would be effective and, and not oversimplifying. So for example, the you know, you can look at that and you can see some relation to El Nino pretty obviously, but there's some, because of the range of scales of data that goes in there, it's it's not easy to be, to say with confidence that you know what's happening at any given time without going back and, and, and looking to see what are the major uh, drivers at that, at that time in the multivariate statistics. But, but I think it's something that we could create and have on hand, I think, um, to help in those explanations when they come, when they're needed. And Henry, for uh, the really lay audience like myself, it's, is it Multivariate Ocean Condition Index? Is that the, the acronym? Yes. Yeah, and so it's like a, a kind of a clustering statistical exercise where you um, you take time series from a bunch of different you know, uh, levels and so that there's these climate indicators, but there's also upwelling, sea surface temperature, and other things that go into this multivariate um, assessment of, you know, uh, how things vary over time, but it's a, a really digested metric, it's fair to say. Um, but you can, there's ways to look at those statistics as they come in and, and unravel a little bit what are the major, major drivers at any one time. And, and that appears to be our lone brave question for, for so far. But I encourage folks uh, to enter questions for any of the presenters as we, we uh, continue. And uh, yeah, Clarissa, I'd like to turn it to you. Great. All systems a go. 
Can you hear me? Good. Not, yeah, not cut off and your audio is good. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so I'll finish off with the Southern California update. Um, as in the past, we'll kind of step through some CDIP images, talk about waves. Uh, you've heard a lot of that already. Then we'll talk about some of our shore station data and glider data, and then wrap it up with some um, fun biology discussions. So let me get my thing to advance. There we go. Oh, now of course it advanced twice. Um, so first off, the uh, CDIP information that's already been covered, but just kind of emphasize that with these atmospheric rivers, we had some really historic wave records at each of the, um, at several of the stations. And you can see them listed here in terms of max height, covering around 15 meters in a place where we had the strongest event since 2008. We recorded the largest individual waves since 1998, interestingly at San Pedro. Uh, might have thought that would have been further in north in Northern California or near someplace like Mavericks, but indeed it was not. Um, and I want to point your attention to the wave bulletins. I know Henry's pointed to some interesting plots related to the CDIP model output um, and how that how that um, matched up relative to observations. Um, but these wave bulletins are a really great way to dive into that information. And so for these atmospheric river events, there was um, a bulletin that really focused on, um, on the particular, the early January events. Um, we also have temperature at the seat at buoys, of course. Uh, what you can see here from the time series plots on the lower part of this, um, this slide is that the long-term trend is basically being followed. We're in a colder, colder, anomalously cold time right now, but basically on track with trend. Um, and some of these nearshore stations, and I'll get into that in a minute a little bit more, were um, below average. And you can see that in our shore station data, looking at Stearns Wharf, Santa Monica Pier, Newport Beach Pier, and Scripps Pier, you can see that as you move into the winter months, um, that there's quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of records that are below normal in terms of temperature. And the WCOFS model also indicates this uh, cooling from as we move from summer into fall and winter, as would be expected. Um, and, and just pointing out that the model imagery on the left is not an anomaly plot, but these shore station plots are showing you um, relative to average over the period that we have going back um, about 17 years. Showing the salinity, um, what I think is interesting here is, of course, we'd expect freshening from those big atmospheric events in the winter months. Hopefully, you can see the time axis. I realize they're quite small in some of these plots. We should rectify that. But the interesting thing is just that latitudinal gradient where you move from Stearns Wharf, which is at Santa Barbara, and you move south, you really start to, you don't see those freshening anomalies quite as much. Um, and I think this was quite obvious in the news that. Santa Barbara and further north were really taking the brunt of those atmospheric river events. And while we did see a significant wave height, of course, at places like San Pedro, we really weren't getting just the massive kinds of discharge and inundation events that were happening further north. Now the glider data, um, we've shown plots like this in the past. Maybe to orient you, the Huffmuller diagram on the left is giving you that kind of space time um, uh, sort of outlook where you're thinking about what's happening from near shore to offshore and then um, on the x-axis through time so as you move forward you can really see the movement and change um, of these of the water water masses and how things like properties like temperature are propagating through space and time um, we've been seeing kind of more more cooling at the 15 50 meter depth and I'm showing you on the right line plots that show the kind of um, coupling with the oceanic Nino index, which we've shown before. So this is the SoCal temperature index, how that aligns with what's happening at the equator. And there's a bit of divergence during the Pacific warm anomaly, but that coupling has sort of realigned, um, albeit with a higher temperature anomalies in SoCal relative to what's happening at the equator, where we've been in a pretty persistent La Nina. Um, this is interesting because if you look at these cross sections from the glider data, um, you're really getting more of a longer term 60 day or more 
outlook of what's what's happening across the basin. Um, and so for that reason, if you look at the interannual anomaly plot at the lower left for temperature, what you'll notice is that there's quite a lot of stratification where you're seeing higher temperatures at the surface and a bolus of cooler, more normal temperatures below that. Um, this isn't capturing those sorts of um, mixing events that you would expect with the atmospheric rivers and the winds that came with them um, because it's a it's a longer integrated time, time series outlook. And so these anomaly patterns though are showing us how things are changing on this longer time frame, um, just like the one I showed you before. So you can see that there actually is some um, overall freshening at the surface layer in terms of salinity, but that's not in this in this sort of um, in this sort of view, this is not indicating what is happening with respect to the atmospheric river events, but really more longer term trends that we're seeing in the, in the Southern California Bight. Uh, now moving into the biology, now you're, many of you are aware that we do this harmful algal bloom sampling at the piers uh, throughout the coast, and Coos does it as well, but I'm, and I'm highlighting um, both of our, um, our shared uh, our shared effort in this realm. We do have some sites further north of Santa Cruz Wharf, but um, really the consistent sampling is from Santa Cruz South. And I'm really pointing out just um, to the right of the dashed line is from where we've talked about HABs in our last talk. Um, as we move forward into fall winter, I just want to point out that there hasn't been a lot of activity except at two piers where we did see Pseudonychia uh, blooming. And when I say not a lot of activity, I'm really just referring to the two organisms that are being illustrated here, Pseudonychia and Alexandrum, because they are the big ones for toxins and public health in California. And these are the ones that we put into our bulletin. So what you're seeing in the blue and green lines is, um, is Pseudonychia, two different groups of Pseudonychia exceeding bloom levels. And this happens to have happened at two sites um, where we really don't have any real-time plankton data, unfortunately, because we have built out this system of imaging flow cytobots, and it would have been great to kind of to kind of capture the rise and fall of blooms like that, where um, the sampling I showed you a minute ago is weekly. This is every 30 minutes to an hour, which really gives us a completely different outlook of what is happening with plankton and what the blooms are doing in real time. And so what I'm just showing you here is a mosaic um, from December from Scripps Pier in the south, moving all the way up to Santa Cruz in the north. And what's always striking when we do this is just the incredible variability that we see in the plankton communities um, and that alongshore axis and moving from things like smaller overall communities at Scripps Pier, some hint of a lingulodinium bloom as you start to move north from Scripps Pier, that's that really dark cell. And then when you get to the north, there was um, a, a real, Akashiwo bloom, and that's one looks kind of like a tooth, and that one can actually cause harm to birds. And so we do keep a close eye on that, even though it is not typically toxic or problematic <laughs> for humans. And then thinking about the cross shore axis, we've had the opportunity to get those out on Cal Coffee cruises as well. And I'm pointing out um, this one cross shore transect just around the, the San Luis Obispo area which is pretty cool because if you're looking at the imagery on the left here, you're seeing a lot of beautiful, large diatoms. And as you move offshore, which is to the right in my images, the plankton community, overall size of the cells in the plankton community goes down. And this is sort of expected with theory. So it's really amazing to see this um, <laughs> bear out in some sampling that is extremely high resolution compared to what we could do with traditional microscopy. And then the lower plot is showing you on the exact same date, what was happening further south in Newport Beach Pier. Um, so guess really near shore at a fixed site, you can see this incredible uh, dinoflagellate community burgeoning and it includes um, a predatory dinoflagellate that is in no doubt feeding on some of the other dinoflagellates there. So that's a heterotrophic dino. Okay, um, I'm just gonna end with um, recapping what happened in August. We talked a lot about this in the last uh, the last West, West Watch webinar, and I wanted to just say that we followed up with some more data, but at the time, you may recall, there was a massive marine mammal stranding event. Um, there were many cruises of opportunity to get data, as well as some other um, coincidental funded cruises that showed some of the epic 
epic domoic acid levels in the subsurface where these animals were no doubt acquiring it. And we also had an imaging flow cytobot out on a Cal Coffee cruise and caught some um, imagery of Pseudonychia in very high abundance. But since then, there's been more analysis on the uh, tissue coming from those marine mammals, those mostly sea lions. And it turns out to be quite a record event for domoic acid levels in animals. Um, again, we, we knew it was bad. There was, it was a really, really high number of animal stranding. But what we saw in some of the, the feces that were collected was over 500,000 nanograms per gram of domoic acid, which we think is a record. And we're working with the marine mammal groups to um, not only evaluate that, but better evaluate what this event was about, why it happened, and how does it fit in with the way we think about these events moving forward and actually how we how we monitor them in real time because that communication could definitely get improved and i think this has really rallied the community around better understanding that so i'll finish there i know megan wants us to to advertise our strategic plan um, it was a, a year in the making and if you're interested we are happy to share it will be online soon thank you i gotta unshare let's see any questions? Maybe I should wait for questions before I unshare. So I'm not even seeing the unshare thing I saw before. What is it? I can take it oh, back. Sorry. No, I there found it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, still, still no other questions. Any, any? We've got just a couple minutes left. Oh, there we go. One's for, for you, Clarissa. Um, is the 45 animals a record or the, I think it's the level of the, the demoic acid of the DA? Yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear. It's the level of demoic acid in the tissue that we think is the record. Um, you know, there were upward almost 400 animals stranded. That is really high. We, you know, we've seen a lot of events that were pretty major. Like when I think back to 2014, which is at the outset of the Pacific Worm Anomaly, um, we saw somewhere on order of 140 animals in Central California strand from demoic acid toxicosis. So this is this this is not only extreme in the number of animals, but it's definitely extreme in terms of how much DA was they were concentrating in their tissue. Great. Well, thanks to all our speakers for for uh, a, a wonderful set of presentations. Uh, Dan, Jan, Henry, and Clarissa, I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to put in a quick plug for our next uh, Westwatch. It'll be Tuesday, March 21st. We're going to start just a, a little bit earlier. It's going to be one o'clock Pacific time. I'm sorry, two o'clock Pacific time because we have an East Coast speaker. The topic is going to be a retrospective on El Nino. And uh, this, this entire Westwatch series was started as a way to kind of keep tabs and, and keep communication open about the 2015, 2016 uh, ENSO event. And so I'd like to do, you know, spend some time with, with folks that have been uh, continuing to study ENSO and how it evolves and what its impacts are and how we how we observe it um, to, to kind of ask the question of, you know, what, what have we learned since then and, and what, uh, what are we still learning? So uh, please tune in in, uh, in March. Uh, and we'll, we'll advertise this to, to all you all. And we'll also have in April uh, the uh, conditions update just like today again. Um, but thanks again for tuning in and thanks to all our speakers for doing an excellent job. We'll also send you all an email when the uh, recording is posting. Uh, have a great rest of your day and thank you very much. <laughs>